Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 212, recorded on October 25th, 2021. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes, just back from an event, and I am in a very rainy, noisy Pacific Northwest, but we're going to do the news. And we're going to start with performance. Just one week ago, Linux block subsystem maintainer Jens Axpo was hitting some new performance heights. After optimizing the kernel, he achieved around 8 0.9 million IOPS per core. He and others began to speculate at that point that they might just be hitting the limits of the hardware. It's too much performance, man. Uh, IOPS, or the input-output operations per second, is like a raw performance measurement that you can use to characterize the performance of a drive. It doesn't directly translate to real-world actual performance, but it does give you an indicator of potential performance. So measuring the IOPS is part of the overall story about how something is performing, including the code paths to get you to that device. And it's one of those tests that Jens can run as he's optimizing the kernel NVMe's IOU ring code or the memory management code, which he also needed to optimize. He makes a tweak and then he runs a test. And after a whole bunch of tweaking, he managed to smash out 10 million IOPS. That is just a remarkable performance milestone. I mean, of course, his system is no slouch as you might expect. An AMD Ryzen 9 5950X with dual Intel P5800X Gen 2 Optane SSDs. Right, super nice. And he's not going through the file system and lots of other caveats here, but this is an insane mark to hit. I mean, there was actual debate if it could even be achieved, and now he's done it. But also... I am a really big fan of these edge case optimization quests that lead to other areas that get improved and we all benefit. Yeah, I think this is a big one for really anyone who's using the Linux kernel. Now, so far, this new performance code has only landed in the kernel's work in progress branch for the block subsystem, but much, if not all of it, should land, fingers crossed, in Linux 5.16. Now, that said, Linux 5.15 is not even out yet, but it did enter its final RC phase early Monday morning. Much like today's episode of Linux Action News, the RC release was a day late. Linus does tend to release on Sundays, but he was traveling this week, and as he noted, his Sunday release was, quote, spoiled by me spending more time in an airplane without Wi-Fi. Well, that's not a lot of fun, but it's a whole lot better than the release being delayed by actual issues with the kernel. hey -o. Linus did note that RC7 of 5.15 looks, quote, nice and small, right in the range of normal. He went on to say that both the number of commits and the diff stat looks fine. It's all pretty small and flat, meaning mostly small trivial changes, with just a couple of peaks for some x86 KVM code and some KSMBD changes. Mmm, excellent, good. Let the KSMBD changes flow. Still the craziest thing they ever let in the kernel. You call it crazy, I call it brilliant. As for when we might actually get to play with it, Michael Larable over at Veronix noted that at this stage, 5.15 is looking quite good. It seems likely it should debut next Sunday. However, as Linus will again be traveling next week, he is inclined, if the need presents itself, to delay the 5.15 release to then hopefully avoid the Linux 5.16 merge window during his next round of travels. But looking ahead to Linux 5.16, we see two important sets of patches out there for those of you who might want to use Linux on a shiny new M1 Mac. Which I plan to test out and even perhaps deploy. We shall see how that goes, but yeah, it looks like a PCI driver for the M1 systems will land in 5.16, and support the 2021 Apple Magic Keyboard as well. Now, we should probably mention there's no Touch ID sensor support just yet. That wasn't in the scope of this work. But everything else is looking pretty darn good. The PCIe-Apple driver, as it's known, was reverse-engineered by Alyssa Rosenzweig and Marc Salger. It was also based on previous work from Corellium and OpenBSD. This is some impressive work in fewer than 1,000 lines of new code in the kernel. You know, I haven't measured this, but I get the impression just from watching the kernel development news that support for the Apple devices is landing faster at, at a more aggressive clip. And 
you just wouldn't have thought it was going to go this way when Apple announced their own closed ecosystem and they were tightening down even further. And it seems like things are better for anyone than ever if they want to run a Mac using Linux. Yeah, I know. It's weird. How how in this new closed era where they've got to design things however they want and not have to play ball with the Intel side of things, how is that easier for Linux? But somehow, it seems to be working out really well. Fingers crossed, though. Who knows what might happen in the future? Yeah, what happens in the future will always be that big question hanging over the platform for Linux users. That we just won't know. We'll have to wait and see. But this PCI driver that's getting in shape for 5.16 looks like it does a lot more than just bring PCI Express up, which it does, and that is important. But it was also the prerequisite for bringing up the USB Type A ports, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth on Apple M1 Mac Minis and MacBooks. You know, like any of the useful ports. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> good. Uh, it really tells me that any Linux distro that's going to work on the M1 is probably going to need to be 5.16 based. Uh, and it's just so awesome to see them work on this. I mean, this is three teams that worked on this, and it's all going upstream for all of us to use. Popping up the stack just a bit. It's been an exciting week for KDE developers who've been preparing the Plasma Wayland session to work with NVIDIA's new GBM support in their binary driver. KDE Plasma 5.23.2 and up will support the GBM backend required to work with recent driver updates by NVIDIA that enable full Wayland support. Yeah, NVIDIA added support for this on their end for GBM with the 495 driver. Along these same lines, Fedora 35 will be shipping soon, featuring GBM with Wayland to use with Gnome Shell. And looking ahead to Plasma 524, I'm sure you'll be happy to see that fingerprint support is finally landing. Oh, another week, another happy dance, two weeks in a row. Yeah, this is great. And this support will allow for unlocking the screen and authenticating those pseudo prompts. I enjoy that a lot when using Gnome on my ThinkPad right now. It just, it feels high end and fancy and well integrated. Definitely some good improvements inbound. Plenty of things for us to keep our eyes on and review sometime in the future. Linode.com slash land. Go there to get $100 and 60 day credit on a new account and you go there to support the show. This show is made possible by you taking advantage of our sponsor's offer. And Linode is one we enthusiastically endorse. So Linode.com slash land. They started in 2003 as one of the first companies in cloud computing. Now, 18 years later, they are the largest independent open cloud provider in the world with 11 global data centers serving nearly a million customers. But they still remain focused on making cloud computing simple, affordable, and accessible to all. They really have the best in-class experience. That's why we host everything on Linode now. Go support the show and find out for yourself at linode.com slash LAN. They have an easy-to-use, powerful cloud dashboard, fantastic, best-in-the-industry customer support, super-fast networking, super-fast NVMe disks, and crazy-fast CPU systems. They really have the best mix of performance, price, and features. linode.com slash LAN. Linux.ting.com. That's where you go to save more on mobile. If you're sick of overpaying for your wireless bill, Linux.ting.com. Go see how much you could save and then take 25 bucks off that and support the show. Ting has nationwide coverage, a great mix of plans, and super fast LTE and 5G, depending on your area. They're straightforward. They're simple to understand plans. I've been a Tink customer since 2013, and there's one reason and one reason only. Ting's a great value. And maybe there's two reasons. They're flexible. Okay, maybe there's three reasons. They have really good customer support. Okay, maybe there's four reasons because they also have a great dashboard. Five reasons they have lots of networks to choose from. Six reasons they also have really great customer support and community. Did I already say that one? I I'm, I'm, I'm really just want you to focus on the one thing, though. Whichever one of those matters the most for you. Go try it out and see what I'm talking about. It's so great. And every plan gets access to Ting's award-winning customer service, nationwide LTE and 5G, and, of course, no contracts ever. How about that? The freedom of no contracts. That's pretty sweet. So just head to linux.ting.com. Check your current phone, create an account, and pick the plan that's right for you. Ting will send you a SIM card. You pop that in your phone, and you can get activated in minutes. They got a great dashboard. Just get started by going to linux.ting.com. It's the next generation of Ting Mobile. It's here. Go see how much you could save and get 25 bucks off that. linux.ting.com. This week, we learned of a new GPL lawsuit that could have some real implications for all of us. The Software Freedom Conservancy, or SFC for short, a nonprofit organization that promotes open source software, 
and defends the general public license, has sued TV maker Vizio for GPL violations. The SFC is suing Vizio because its SmartCast OS is based on Linux, uses U-Boot, TAR, glibc, FFmpeg, and a whole bunch of other free software. But Vizio is not making the sources available, as is required by the GPL. This news probably doesn't really come as a surprise to anyone listening to this show. There have been attempts to get Vizio to address this since 2018. The Conservancy engaged in at least a year-long attempt of diplomacy to get them to understand the terms of the GPL, and, well, nothing. What is a bit surprising about this case, though, is that the SFC is taking a new approach. The lawsuit is being made as the purchaser of a product, which illegally contains copylefted code. This approach makes it the first legal case that focuses on the rights of individual consumers as third-party GPL beneficiaries. According to this lawsuit, you, as the buyer, also have the right to access that source code. I like this, and I'd love to see this tested. And I, I, I mean, I'm a little nervous about seeing it tested, but I still want to see it tested. And there is a real right to repair element to this, even if you're not a developer. Getting access to this source code could give you vital bits of information when attempting to make repairs years down the road. No kidding. Otherwise, it's just a black box. I think the SFC hopes to demonstrate that it's not just the copyright holders, but also the users who are entitled to rights. You also have the fact that eventually, Vizio will just abandon this product and its software. Sometimes vendors deactivate devices when they no longer want to support them. But most of the time, they just silently stop updating them and just hope you won't notice. The open source community could step up in some cases for popular products, and we could support them years beyond what the original vendor might be willing to do. We have seen so many examples of that. The hardware works just fine, but the software is out of support. Karen Sandler of the SFC pointed out this issue is even hotter right now, saying, quote, The global supply chain shortages that have affected everything, from cars to consumer electronics, underscores one of the reasons why it's important to be able to repair products we already own. She goes on to say, Even without supply chain challenges, the forced obsolescence of devices like TVs isn't in the best interest of the consumer or even the planet. Hmm, fair points indeed. I think it's noteworthy that the lawsuit seeks no monetary damages. Instead, it's only asking that Vizio give access to the technical information that the copyleft license has always required. We'll definitely keep our eyes on this and everything else going on in the world of Linux and open source. Be sure to check out linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to keep in touch. And be sure to check out Linux Unplugged 429 coming out this week for something very special. And as for us, we'll be back next Monday, hopefully on time this time, with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week.